so uh, what I want to be covering today is uh, suicidal behavior with over-controlled clients. You know, a, a lot of discussion therapeutically revolves around clients who are under control. You know, classically those are going to be people with BPD, um, but uh, not a lot of conversation is out there with, with clients who are over-controlled. Now, unfortunately, I had a client who I had to make a tough call exactly what the devil her situation was. So I'm going to get into her suicide attempt, uh, what went into my clinical thinking, and uh, trying to give some sort of practical information here of like how the heck do you actually do what you need to do in, in Jerusalem to get people committed against their will. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Not, not an easy situation. No. So a little bit of background with the client. The, the, the background here is we're talking about a 19-year-old Canadian made Aliyah. Uh, she's biologically female but she identifies as non-binary in terms of her gender identity. Uh, pronouns are unspecified, so I'm just going to proceed calling her a she. Uh, the, the, the population of, of people who are suffering gender dys a sudden onset of gender dysmorphia is highly, um, highly likely you're going to be running into to suicide. Um, it, research shows it's not necessarily because they have gender dysmorphia. I mean, activists make that claim, but it doesn't pan out in the research. When you actually do deconstruction studies and factor analysis, it really doesn't add up. You know, this population is, 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 is incredibly, incredibly burdened by multiple uh, uh, comorbidity, and we're going to be seeing this in this case as well. That uh, basically the only thing this person unfortunately wasn't diagnosed with was narcissism. Short of that, we're, we're, we're looking at a pretty tough case. Um, dropped out of university due to that symptomology. Uh, parents reached out to me and they're reporting anxiety, depression. Uh, she was isolating herself, wasn't leaving the house, uh, you know, keeping, keeping within her room, not even, not, even leaving, not even leaving her room except to go to the bathroom and, and to look for food, basically, but that was, that was about it. Um, like I said, you know, in terms of the assessment phase, highly, highly uh, sim uh, symptomatic. We're looking at we're, uh, multiple personality disorders. You know, what, what, what's on the screen here is the, C the SCL90, where the, 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 the scores in orange is the clinical cutoff, and her scores are in blue. So from, from anxiety, depression, paranoia, psychoticism, you know, across the board, we're seeing incredibly high scores with this with this client. Um, looking, looking at personality disorders, like I said, you know, except for narcissism, we're looking at a pretty tough case across the board. As, as, far, as far as the big five is concerned, you, you see there's a tremendous tension here um, between incredibly high openness scores. You know, like I said, she's an artist, she plays music, very open to ideas, an incredibly intelligent person, but her neuroticism levels were also dramatic. So this is a person who's incredibly afraid and incredibly interested in the world simultaneously. So she quite literally being torn in two in terms of her, in terms of her experience of life. So the, the, treatment, the treatment approach I took with this client, I, I decided, because really we're, we're kind of looking at either I'm going to give a classic DBT intervention here, or I went with radically open DBT. It's an incredibly different, even though they have the name DBT and it, it's an incredibly different approach uh, therapeutically. It's, it's much less uh, directive. Um, there's a strong emphasis on self-inquiry and self-discovery. And, and the one, one main reason why I chose this Specifically, was the high levels of rigidity. Even though that you know, in her own, her own assessment of herself, she she sees herself as being highly agreeable. She also suffers from uh, some severe autism, functional autism. So high, high levels of rigidity, um, as in the in the in the, the vindictiveness, the anger, the resentment. You know, these were not passing emotions that you'd see in a BPD client, these were, these were very rooted in her permanent experience of the world. So RODBT is designed for clients like that. The, the, the idea here is to try and increase social signaling, to understand and interpret other, other people in a social situation, enhance engagement, get her in the world, and, and as far as on my end, modeling vulnerability and connectedness. You know, and it actually, it, it was, it was, it, it, 
it was nice because we actually had a we have a really good relationship and like it's, it's it's actually easy to like her you know she's very creative there is a compassionate side to this person and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's really nice working with her, but like I said, very, very, um, very rigid and a lot of anger, a lot of hostility there. Mentalization was also being used to, again, to help her interpret other people's intentions, just being able to understand emotions, what other people might be thinking, what they're feeling, why they're doing what they're doing. Um, emphasized emotional regulation skills, valued action as motivators, you know, she has a lot of dreams, and so that, that I was very much trying to leverage in terms of keeping her going as a counter-narrative to the, the dark thoughts she was having. When, when she came into treatment, you know, I, I did a, I did a uh, suicide assessment, it, it was, she had just dark thoughts, they were not, there were no plans. And she had a lot, a lot going for her. So in terms of valued action, there was, there was a well to draw from in what she wanted to do and why she wanted to do it. As far as the, as far as the uh, sudden onset gender dysmorphia, I was taking a watch and wait approach, um, giving her again. That's very much in the spirit of, of RODBT self inquiry. What, what, what does it mean that she's in, that she, she has the feeling she's having about herself, even gender wise. So, so that was the treatment protocol. Those, you know, the treatment targets. You know, obviously trying to reduce some of these symptoms, get her in the world. You know, increase the, a situation with her family, friends, work, um, nurturing relationships outside of therapy, and and that was happening. She was starting to hold down a job. She was making friends. She was getting. She finally got out of her room, um, and and she was, you know, really, you know, for for quite for quite a while, living a living a a pretty standard teenage life. Um, the treatment hierarchy, I was keeping a, a, a look at the, the, the life-threatening behaviors. Therapeutic alliance ruptures were, were very much, you know, a center stage in this treatment. And then the, 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 the rest of the work being on maladaptive or control behaviors, you know, trying to get more emotionally expressive you know, trying to reduce that hyper-detailed focus, being less cautious, reducing the rigidity and rule-governed behavior, actually having, uh, having a, a, cl a close and tight fit with the environment as opposed to these rules that, that had been created and then also predicated on the, on the autism. So treatment outcomes here. After, after three months, like I said, things were, were, were looking really great. She was working at our local restaurant. Like I said, strong friendships. Things were, were really going extremely well for this client. We were seeing a dramatic drop in, in uh, symptom manifestation as well. Uh, but again, before, before diving into the, the, the suicide aspect of this, it, you know, like, it, like, it, it does help to kind of compare these two suicidal groups. Like I said, you know, most, most talk really is on clients with BPD. And you know we can kind of look at those people as under control clients, for lack of a better term. You know, like I said, these are going to be cluster B uh, sort of issues, dramatic, erratic personality uh, personality structures, um, anxious attachment style, poor impulse control, and you know their suicide attempts are going to be almost entirely mood dependent. They're not planning anything. You know, they want to kill themselves, and then when they've calmed down, they really don't want to kill themselves. You know, it's not unheard of having a client ending up in hospital and saying, you know, like saying, really, I really don't want to kill myself anymore. I really don't need to, I don't need to be in hospital. And that's, that's legitimate. They really don't want to kill themselves. And the self-harm is not a secret with this, with this group. Here was a lot different. You know, we're, we're looking at, we're looking with, at this, uh, at this client, um, cluster A and cluster C, I mean, as well as cluster B. I mean, there was a dramatic, you know, across the board issues with personality personality disorders here, but, but I felt like with this client it was much more in this, in this realm. Um, avoid an attachment style and just re real social deficits and low, low, low openness, although that's not her personality type here, her ability to interpret people might as well, she might as well have had low openness, just having that inability to interpret the world around her. Um, you know, this, this demographic has higher suicide rates than people with BPD. And, and it's worth mentioning also suicide's pretty, suicide thoughts are pretty common. Uh, uh, you know, research shows about half the human population at some point in their life has thought about it, whether 
20% being non-specified thoughts or 10% actually attempting it. You know, suicide is not so uncommon. But what 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 we're looking at here with this demographic is there this is a secret. You know, they've decided probably by the first session that they have a plan, they know when they're going to do it, they know how they're going to do it. That that there 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 is a there is a well thought out rigid um, uh, uh, outline of, of, of the act of suicide. And it's going to be motivated by the, the isolation. It's going to be motivated by the inability to interpret social signaling and, and having those two high standards. So that, 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 that was what we were looking at here in, uh, in this case. Uh, high desire for revenge. She really was angry at the world. A powerful sense of other people having more than her. Wanting to punish, uh, punish her family for what she perceived them as doing. So that was one motivating factor here with the, with the attempt. And also there was this aspect of, you know, almost like the, the play, uh, validating her idea of a just world, that, that this is not a world that fits her, that, um, that while other people are, deser are, are deserving of her not being here, that it's right, it's correct, it's proper that she should not be alive. So again, not mood governed. This is completely rule governed behavior, and and also you know she also fit the, the the bill here with romanticizing that suicide. That it was it was it was noble. It was it was it was pure. It was beautiful for her to leave leave the world. You know, on top of the uh, the intense anger. I'll have a question. Yeah. On this one. So you said that she had multiple attempts to kill herself. Yeah. Around, yes. Going, you have to be careful about that. But yes. My question: I wanted to know if you talked about the fear around getting better, which I talk about a lot. Yeah. Start getting a lot yeah. Here in this case, it, it was the it, there was it wasn't the fear of getting better. It was the fact that there were very quickly a lot of different things coming up that lost her job, running into conflict with the family, all the gains, there was natural ebb and flow. And so, uh, you know, I definitely was trying to prepare her as best I could, you know, in, in almost every other sh session, when I started to see, hey, this is actually taking off, you know, she really does have a lot of great, uh, great resources. She is a great, great human being. You know, of course it's gonna, it's gonna take off. It was gonna be, okay, man, when, when is this, when is the next shoe, and when's the, when's the other shoe gonna fall? You know, and being ready for that. And they, 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 it wasn't there. It just wasn't there. It just wasn't there. So, you know, her coming in, I had done a semi-structured suicide interview. We established a safety plan, you know, self-soothing, calming techniques, who to call, emergency numbers. Um, and and that was that was in place, and it looked like it was pretty good. It was only dark thoughts. There was nothing. There was nothing that was planned out. Um, when when the suicide was announced, like I said, there were a couple. There were many many setbacks that happened right away. The brother, you know, she had a brother who had moved out. He was a, a, a incredible stabilizing force in her life. As soon as he wasn't there anymore, that sent her for a tailspin. Um, there was a lot of increase in conflict at home, you know, fights with mom, fights with dad, and mom and dad fighting as well. You know, they had interpersonal, you know, inter interrelationship conflict between the two of them. Um, and she lost her job. You know, she, she, because of anxiety, she refused to interact with customers at the restaurant. She was only holding back in the kitchen. And just because she was willing to do less, she was making less money and, and getting, getting uh, you know, paycheck after paycheck that didn't add up to everybody else's. She was furious, she had an explosion, she, she verbally and quite near physically attacked her boss and lost that job pretty quick. F lost friends, they reached out, you know, even after such an explosion, you know, this is a really nice person, you know, at heart, she really has that, that, that part of her. People reached out, you know, friends who had been there with her for quite, for quite some time and she just rejected them. You know, she saw them as being being fake, lying to her, you know, the phobia is, is, is definitely manifesting, and she kicked them out of her life. 
she started even picking fights with random people and went back to her room. She stopped going out on her on her walks. And so we were right back to square one, except now we have a lot, a lot more, you know, hopelessness, a lot more hopelessness than, than what was there originally. Um, you know, as soon as this was happening, I raised concerns with her parents. I said, really watch her. I don't like where this is going. She hadn't admitted to me at that time that she had any plans, you know, and, and at that stage I was taking a, a motivational interviewing approach because there was that, that, um, that, you know, teeter-tottering, uh, ambivalence going on and just getting her talking about her plans getting her talking about the future you know spelling out in detail what she wanted to achieve you know I, I was I was really hoping to cash in on on her her values and her hope for her future and and all the things she wanted to do to keep her to keep her in the game and, and make a second go of things and recover from all of these losses that really happened within a within a week's time so it was all of these were very sudden um, the suicide attempt so I got, a, I got a text Tuesday night that she uh, had already attempted suicide. Um, she had downed, a, downed half a bottle of, of Acamol and that she was going to make another attempt and she was discontinuing therapy. That was the text I received. Uh, so apparently that had happened early Monday, this suicide attempt. So immediately I called up her parents, you know, what is going on? And they were already in bed. They had decided not to do anything. They, they just kind of wrote it off as this is another, this is another, you know, piece of drama. It's a headache. They don't want to deal with it. But, but my sense of it was this was serious. You know, she had made the attempt and a part of it was the, she didn't really understand what she was, how to do it, so to speak. There was a, a lack of understanding, you know, one can write off, oh, it was only half a bottle of, of, of Tylenol, like, sure, that's serious, but does she really mean it? I, I think that's where the parents were coming from, that, that they thought it was more of a cry for help than anything else, but this, I don't believe, was a cry for help. This was, she simply didn't know how to do it right, unfortunately. You know, for, fortunately for us, but unfortunately having that, that detachment, um, even in the act. So... I, I told them they definitely need to contact emergency services. I'm going to I'm going to call her up immediately. I'm going to get a sense of what's going on here, and you know at that point I put in I put into uh, uh, you know the the RODBT has a pretty well outlined suicide protocol of how to of how to try and talk down a client. It's really pulling pulling on the guilt. You know honesty, trust. Um, um, you know va the values that are going to be you know that are going to be held tightly by the client you know so it, it's not it's not you know it's not like a, a BPD client where you have this question you don't want to you don't want to positively reinforce this behavior how much do you do you actually say you know oftentimes you know given the case with BPD clients you know you have you know neutral face you're not really showing much concern you might even say you don't have any phone call privileges for the week. There is actually in, in, in normal DBT, a, pun, a, a punisher is often used in these cases. So this is the exact opposite. You know, you, you are really diving deep to pull out the emotion here. Help me understand, you know, what set this off? You know, what are you trying to tell me? You know, have I, have I, you know, invite criticism. How did I fail you here? You know, what, did I say anything that triggered this? You're, you're validating that sure, you know, that she, you know, this person has these plans. You understand where they're coming from. But at the same time, you're really trying to pull on the heartstrings to, to convince this client, please stay with me. You know, I really care about you. You're an important person in my life. You're an important person in your family's life. Getting them thinking about their family obligation, cashing in on that rigidity, their obligation to stay alive. Um, while you're doing this, you're trying to maintain a loose balance here. It's, it's, even though it's highly emotionally charged, you know, these are very big, you know, I don't know what I would do without you statements are very emotionally charged. You're trying to do it in a very almost laid back sort of way because the more pressure you put on this client in, in intensity can backfire. So you're trying to get the message across while simultaneously not 
you, you mean the words, but you don't want to put, you know, be full throttle with them. So, you know, you're doing eye wags, winks, you know, you're leaning back in your chair. The pace is slow, a lot of open gestures. There, there's safety here, this is okay. You know, nothing bad's gonna happen here. You know, I'm not, you know, not, I'm not threatening you, sort of, sort of physical gestures. Taking breaks, hey, let's get a coffee. I couldn't exactly do that over the phone, but you know, just start schmoozing about random stuff just to bring the emotional intensity That's down. Sweet you know, while then hiking it back up. So there is this seesaw effect, you know, past that, okay, practically speaking, what can we do to get rid of, you know, is there, is there, is there Tylenol still, can you flush that? Is there anything that can hurt you? Okay, let's get rid of that. Regulating behavior, uh, you know, uh, is, is a key factor here. Trying to get the person to be self-inquiring, you know, like what, what exactly is motivating you here? What what exactly are you trying to do here? Who are you trying to punish? Is that really going to punish people? So that was that was the protocol I jumped into. It was a, it was about an hour and a half of that seesaw of moving in, backing out, moving in, backing out. It didn't go anywhere. She 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 threatened to hang up on me the entire time and wouldn't. But at a certain point, it was like I'm tired. I got I gotta go. You know, <laughs> you know, she just was. She just couldn't maintain the conversation. But she didn't want to reject me either, which was a good sign. You know, that was a very good sign. Uh, but despite that, I didn't get a I didn't get a commitment out of her to not go through with it. I had an indication she was going to go through with it. And so we we called mom and I called mom and dad, and we got emergency services in there to to sort out to sort out the situation. <sighs> What happened? You know, after four hours of, of emergency services being there, they could not get her committed. She, even though, you know, my opinion, she, you know, like the scores were kind of showing, there was an element of psychoticism present, you know, from the get-go. She was definitely uh, a danger to herself and others, and she was wanting to discontinue therapy. Those three requirements in Israel are enough to get someone committed, the people on the scene, they didn't see it. They didn't. They didn't want to take my word for it, and they they let her be. Well, the following day, she tried again, and this time she used two bottles of Tylenol. Despite the fact that I had I had written a note to the uh, psychiatra Mehuzi, the district psychiatrist, once. Emergency services don't commit the person forcibly. You as a therapist have the option here of saying, you know what, you guys are wrong. You call up the you call up the district psychiatrist, you write a letter, explain the situation, and they should be, uh, you know, in theory be available 24/7, in reality not. Here are the numbers I called, these are the emails that I that I was able to get a hold of. I got no answers from them. I wrote my letter, I emailed it in, I got nothing out of them. And, and as far as I can I can I can see they never got involved one bit, despite the repeated calls, repeated emails. Um, it was it was quite it was quite an adventure even trying to track down these numbers. Nobody knew what they were. The police did not know who to call. When I called up the the I called up a, a particular um, um, a, a particular um, uh, you know hospital that should that should have a psychiatric hospital they should have had numbers they didn't have numbers the the lady I talked to said Google it that's what I had that's what I had in this case so I Googled it and this is this is what I came up with she was put in she was put in hospital. The second round, and they decided there was definitely those three, <laughs> those three issues were at play, and she was committed finally after the second attempt. Um, take 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 away from from the from the case. Um, it was a it was a complicated case. Uh, it was a hard call in terms of how to exactly uh, diagnose her to begin with. But uh, it was more a story of you know the failures of the system than anything else to get her to get her taken care of sooner, as opposed to having to wait it out and have that that second that second suicide attempt. But um, as of now, she's she's uh, she's in hospital. Things seem to be going well. She's finally on medication, uh, which she had been refusing for a while, and so it, it looks like there's a pretty decent shot here of of a recovery with this client.